flight director today. He is at the helm and will be pulling his team here for a go, no-go decision in about uh, 16 minutes. Assuming all continues on track, Starliner's orbital maneuvering and, Al and attitude control thrusters, or OMAX, will fire up at 6.23 a.m. Central Time, and that will drop the spacecraft back out of orbit and begin the journey home. Given that, Starliner should touch down for historic first landing at White Sands Space Harbor in New Mexico at 6.57. At the moment, though, NASA is, uh, the team here in the mission control room is um, still got a lot of work to do to finish preparing for that launch. And earlier in this shift, this team got a briefing on the uh, weather at White Sands, uh, which is looking promising today. It's definitely going to be chilly for the landing team heading out to meet Starliner. Temperatures are expected to drop down to around 22 or 23 degrees Fahrenheit. Right before sunrise, which is when Starliner is going to come down. And that's about the, um, and then their clouds are scattered, but the wind should be light. All in all, it'll look pretty good. Unfortunately, though, we have chosen the longest night of the year to bring Starliner home. Happy winter solstice to everyone. It's going to be about 5.57 a.m. Mountain Time there in New Mexico, and the sun won't be up until 7.04. So we will have some cameras out there. Uh, you can see the landing team gathering here, what it looks like now. Uh, we'll show you as much as possible, but it, it, will, it will be dark for a little while. So. so we have a lot coming up to show you here on NASA TV. But before we get too far into the landing operations, we do want to look back at Friday's launch of Starliner, heading into a... Uh, Launch replay to take a look at that brilliant morning liftoff from Cape Canaveral. Now 10 seconds into flight. So there you see the United Launch Alliance Atlas V heading into the skies above Cape Canaveral. Crowds there gathered to watch it as it lifted off on its journey. Launch was, of course, timed to uh, catch up precisely to the International Space Station's orbit. One minute, 20 seconds into flight. Body rate responses on the vehicle look good. One minute, 30 seconds in, standing by for SRV burnout. And we have burnout on both solid rocket boosters. Atlas will hold on to the SRVs for an additional 48 seconds prior to jettison. RD-180 has gone back up to full thrust as expected. Engine response looks good. One minute, 50 seconds in. Atlas is now 17 miles in altitude, 11 and a half miles downrange distance, traveling at 2,300 miles per hour. Now passing two minutes into flight. RD-180 engine operating parameters continue to look good at full thrust. And at two minutes, 11 seconds into flight, the Atlas rocket now weighs just one. So it really was a beautiful launch, and despite the uh, fact that we're not going to be visiting the space station, we are still accomplishing a lot of Starliner's mission objectives. That's right. First up, there was the launch itself, which confirmed the human rating for the Atlas V rocket. Then yesterday, Starliner was able to establish a connection with the space station while the station was about 500 kilometers away to test out sending commands from the ground through the space station. We also got a good report card on Starliner's state and attitude knowledge demonstration. The three SIGIs, or the Space Integrated GPS and Inertial Navigation System units, were able to provide really good navigation. And we were also able to perform a good checkout of the system that would have allowed us to connect to the space station's docking adapter. 
And our anthropomorphic, anthropometric test article, Rosie the Rocketeer, is still strapped in the commander's seat and collecting data for us. We can't wait to see what she has to tell us when she gets back. Of course, there's been a lot of uh, a lot of folks asking about Rosie, and uh, she is she is still up there. Rosie and Starliner should be landing in uh, one hour in five minutes now. But a lot still has to happen before touchdown, so we're going to take a look at what's ahead in the mission profile. 3.5G acceleration limit. Engine responses will all look good. Three minutes, 55 seconds into flight. And Centaur's begun the boost phase chill down sequence. And lift off the rise of Starliner and a new era in human spaceflight. And Flight Director Richard Jones has given a uh, go to uh, commence the deorbit burn at the prescribed time. Coming up for uh, setting the course for a landing by Starliner out in New Mexico an hour and two minutes from now. Richard Jones pulled his team and uh, everyone is go. That is pending one last uh, bit of uh, work that needs to be done on the propulsion officer's side, just making sure that uh, manifold valve is open on the uh, orbital maneuvering and attitude control system. That should happen about 10 minutes before the deorbit burn. So the first step in, uh, in getting there, of course, and getting back to New Mexico is the uh, deorbit burn. And that is, that is coming up at uh, 623 Eastern time. And that is going to be a 55-second um, burn using uh, firing using four of the uh, orbital maneuvering and control engines on Starliner. To get ready for that, the team here on the ground is disconnecting Starliner solar rays and radiators. The spacecraft has enough power to get home now, and its sublimators will take over cooling. And as we promised, we have a number of teams around uh, around America um, taking part in today's landing operations. One of those teams is, of course, down at White Sands, New Mexico, at the landing site. And 
We're going out there now to uh, Boeing's Josh Barrett and NASA's Dan Hewitt. Landings, I imagine yeah. this setup looks light, quite a lot different. How do you expect this to go? Yeah, it is vastly different. I mean, uh, if you if you follow the International Space Station, we've been landing our astronauts in Kazakhstan and the Soyuz for several years now. And that, it's a lot of airborne assets. It's an extremely remote area, so there's no way to really drive on except in limited vehicles. Uh, one of the nice things about bringing landings like this back to America is we're much closer to cities, much better infrastructure, things like that. So it's great to see the convoy lined up. We've had a lot of exercises with the teams out here uh, just over the last year or so as they've refined all of their procedures and everything to get ready for this landing. It's running like a well-oiled machine now. There's a bunch of different teams. Everybody's color-coded, so they all have their specific jobs, uh, but it's great to see. Uh, why, don't, why don't we walk through some of the teams and what they're going to be doing? Today. Yeah, so let's start over here, Jim. Why don't, or Tim, why don't you follow me? So let's go up here. We'll kind of go line by line for the convoy. So we have our command vehicle up front here. That's where our recovery operations leader is and our recovery director. Those are the two guys who are really in charge of this whole operation, make sure the procedures go exactly as planned. Right behind them, we have our gold team. They have a very important job. They're the first to the vehicle, and they actually sniff for hydrazine. Now, the crew module uses uh, hydrazine as a propellant, and if it does turn into a vapor, it can be very toxic and damaging to your health if you inhale it. So they will be full up in an escape hazmat-style suits, protected from that hydrazine. They use these special sensors to sniff for it and make sure the rest of the recovery uh, uh, convoy can come up to the vehicle. Now, going over here, the next line, we have our silver team. They're right behind gold team after gold team clears it. Their first job is to ground the vehicle. So the vehicle will be powered down, but there could be some residual electricity on it. And so before anyone can touch the vehicle, they're actually gonna ground the vehicle and discharge any electricity from it. Then up next is blue team. That's us, or the blue vest. We're in charge of showing everyone what's going on. We've got situational awareness cameras, uh, all of the microwave equipment to get back to our satellite uplink and make sure you guys can see this recovery effort. Uh, next, we're going over here to the green team. So you see these big HVAC trailers right here? They're going to hook those up to the crew module to get some ground cooling on it. But their very first job, since it's so cold, it's 22 degrees, they're going to put an environmental enclosure on the crew module. It looks kind of like a big inflatable crew module sized bouncy house, but it's going to wrap around the vehicle, hug it, and we're gonna get some warm air on the crew module and make sure the propellant lines don't freeze. And then after them is the red team. They're a lot of fun to watch. They are mostly Boeing fire rescue uh, employees. Um, Let's go up here and so I can show you the mobile access platform. So here, that platform will get backed up to the hatch on the crew module. That gives our teams access to the hatch. Uh, right now, since there's no astronauts on board, we're just going to open up the hatch. Uh, one of our engineers, Selena Dopart, is going to go inside and run a couple of tests. But uh, on a crew landing, that's where the crew will come out of the vehicle and be taken into this medical truck right here behind me for their initial post-landing medical checkups. And that's pretty much the convoy. So I'm going to go back here over with Dan. Yeah, thanks, Josh. Great <laughs> walk through. And as you can tell, he's really wanting to keep moving because it is pretty cold out here for the teams today. Uh, we are on the blue team, and we are going to be bringing you guys a couple of different views, hopefully, of the castle today. There's a bunch of assets out here, one of which is just about 100 yards or so away from us. There's some tracker cameras on one of the main trucks that drive out here, the MDTV, the and the, M the MLCC, so we have our MDTV, that's Mobile Data and Tracking Vehicle. It's got three cameras on it, two of them are visible, one of them are, is infrared, and since it's so dark out, that's probably what we'll be relying on. And then next to it, we have our Mobile Command Vehicle, the Mobile Landing Control Center. Those guys are looped in with Houston, and uh, you know that's really our link back to mission control. That is where the uh, notification that the crew module has landed will come through. They will relay that to us on our field radios, and this whole thing's gonna get moving. Yeah, and so in addition to those assets, we'll have a couple more ground track cameras that we'll be looking to bring views of Starliner coming down for. 
And once again, we're going to have a WV57 in the air, hopefully getting some views of Starliner as it's doing that entry interface, so plunging through the Earth's atmosphere and then watching the parachutes come out, the heat shield jettison, a number of different things. So we are working to bring you all those views during the live coverage today. It is dark, so it's not going to be the prettiest picture, but we should have some great shots of Starliner coming down. And I do want to reiterate the teams we have trained. Actually, it was a couple months ago. We were right here at this very landing site training in pitch black conditions. We were reporting at 1 a.m. It was quite a bit warmer. It was. It but, was. You know, we're, we're ready for this here. Uh, the team's ready for it. We've been on site since 1 a.m. They are locked in and ready to execute and ready to recover uh, the first American orbital capsule to land on land. Yeah, and there's going to be a couple of events on the way down, and I know Steve and Brandy are going to walk you guys through this quite a bit, but we're going to be looking for a couple of key things after that entry interface, so once they're through the atmosphere. That forward heat shield's going to come off and descend under parachutes. The drogue chutes are going to come out, and once those have done the initial steadying of the vehicle, the pilots will deploy and then bring out the main parachutes, which is going to do the vast bulk of the slowing. And then once we get down a little bit lower, I think a couple thousand feet off the ground still. About 3,000, yeah. About 3,000, that heat shield's going to pop off, and that's going to reveal the landing airbags, which will inflate and then allow Starliner to come down nice and soft on the ground. What's that final speed as we touch down again, Josh? It's about 28 feet per second. I know you asked for miles an hour. I think we're about 19 miles an hour. But that's still a, a very soft landing, especially under those airbags. All the testing we've done, even on worst-case scenarios, with airbags out coming down faster than we predicted, the loads on the crew were actually uh, lower than we did in our than we predicted in our analyses. So that's a good surprise to have. Yeah, and a lot of the operations that we're going to see today will be very close to the exact same as when we have a crew on board. Some of the obvious things that will be different is we're not going to be pulling anybody out of the capsule today. We don't quite have all of the same medical personnel that would come. Uh, if you've ever seen a Soyuz landing, it's very common for the crew to come out, and then they always have a flight doctor with them, a flight surgeon. That's somebody who's assigned to a crew member before their flight, during flight, and after just to provide that medical care. Nurses and a number of other personnel who are just kind of there on location for the crew. We know coming home from space after six months is a little jarring on the body, so we make sure and do the best we can to take care of these crew members once they're back on terra firma. Yeah. Um you know, you watch a lot of those Russian landings, the, the crew members uh, are assisted out, and that's actually why we tapped our uh, fire rescue Boeing fire teams here. They're trained in enclosed uh, area rescue. Uh, they're going to actually go in and extricate those crew members. And that's actually a word I learned recently. There's a difference between extrication and evacuation. Extrication is actually going in and pulling someone out of the vehicle. So that's what our uh, fire firefighters will be doing. And uh, I will say they're... They're fantastic to watch. These guys work so well together going, pulling that platform up to the crew module, opening up that hatch and getting access to those crew members. I know everyone's curious about how Rosie's doing. We're not going to see her get pulled out of yep. the vehicle today. She's actually pretty heavy. Uh, anthropometric test devices are loaded down with a lot of weights and sensors and stuff. So yep. it'll be a work to get her out. So we're gonna leave her there for now, but she's all right. Uh, yeah, but. and we do have some of those crew members that are going to be flying on Starliner. They are here with the teams of observing all of the uh, operations today. Among them, the, the crew flight test, so the first astronauts that are going to fly on Starliner, Chris Ferguson from Boeing, and then Nicole Mann and Mike Fink from NASA. We also have Sir, uh, Sunny Williams on site with us, and she's going to be actually flying in this Starliner that's coming home today. Yeah, so I'm sure this is a really special moment for her, seeing her her spacecraft come down. But we've got a lot to get through. As uh, you know, our, our senior vice president Jim Chilton said yesterday to the media, this stuff is not for the faint of heart. We have a lot to prove here. And landing, there's no point in sending people to space if you can't bring them home safely. So this is a very critical operation. Yeah. Well, we're going to bring you as much video as we possibly can on the way out. Uh, we're going to have some cameras rigged up, and we'll be on the ground with the capsule once it's down. And again, we'll, we'll be looking for some airborne and some ground tracker cameras to provide views, probably an infrared because pitch black outside of Starliner as it reenters. And we're, we're locked in and loaded here, and we're ready to go. Yeah, so Steve and Brandy, uh, we'll go back to you guys for updates from the flight control team. That deorbit burn should be coming up soon.
Thanks so much, Josh and Dan. We really appreciate y'all braving the cold to bring us those views, and we really are looking forward to what you're going to show us a little bit later. And uh, at this point, speaking of things that are coming up, Starliner is over the uh, South Indian Ocean, heading um, heading below Australia before it uh, comes over the Pacific, where it will perform the deorbit burn in about uh, 16 minutes and 18 seconds. And at that point, uh, after the deorbit de burn, of course, the service module that is on the uh, attached to the crew module will separate and that will re-enter on its own it will not uh, it will not it's basically going to be disposed of and the crew module is what will fly then through the uh, through the heat of re-entry and on over the uh, skies of uh, of New Mexico where, where Dan and uh, Josh are waiting to retrieve it and that will all get kicked off with a deorbit burn coming up in uh, 15 minutes now. But while we wait for uh, that to take place, we are going to talk now with Starliner engineer Jim May, who's been standing by to tell us a little bit more about the deorbit process and what we've already accomplished on this mission. Responsibility on this program is making sure that the way we train is safe enough for us to fly. The astronauts are actually pretty easy to work with, uh, so we make their flight more difficult. Nominally, we want a flight to go um, fully autonomous all the way to station with no problems. Um, but in the event of an emergency, we have to train the crew to be able to react to those emergencies um, in a safely and timely manner. So we make their job as hard as possible by adding as many problems as we can during the training sessions. Chris Ferguson was my hiring manager. He was the first person I talked to on this program when I got started. And so making sure both your friend uh, your manager, uh, your your astronauts representing your country, um, making sure that they're safe is very extremely important to me. Welcome, Jim. Good morning. Jim, one of the questions we've been asked is whether the mission elapsed time problem that crept into the orbital insertion burn could cause an issue today during this during this phase, during this deorbit landing phase. Tell us how the software has been tested in the past two days to confirm that this problem is not going to show itself again. Sure. So the mission elapsed time has been updated. Um, the flight control team, Richard Jones, they recognized that. Uh, we're able to command the vehicle to change its mission elapsed time, uh, which then goes into all of the flight management computers. So all the computers are now in agreement with what the mission elapsed time should be, and all of the continuing automated flight features that use that time are going to follow it I mean, have been, and been, have been successfully following it ever since. That's great news. So I know that um, the software is, is really able to do a lot uh, for Starliner and, and handles a lot of the mission events, but how, how does that interact with the team here in Mission Control? The team in Mission Control is watching what the flight control system is going to tell the vehicle what to do. Uh, so there are parts of the spacecraft inside of the flight software that say, hey, this is where the vehicle needs to point, and this is where the vehicle is going to need to go to in the future in order to do things like uh, deorbit or rendezvous and things of that nature. So the flight control team on the ground is looking at that data and maybe making updates to it should they be wanting to make any changes to the flight plan in the future. But the ground control team always knows where the vehicle is going to be pointed, where it's pointed now, and everything that it wants to do uh, to remain on the flight plan as, as, as designed. And Jim, you've been working this program for uh, for a while. Tell me about some of the things. Um, how are you feeling with the uh, with the way? I mean, just to see that Starliner is up in space and now it's getting ready to come home. What are some of the things going through your going through your mind now? You know, this this next phase of flight is a very critical one. It's one that we actually train a lot of the crew for um, most extensively. And so I'm looking forward to seeing the spacecraft fly the automated reentry plan uh, just as we designed. Um, because, you know, it, that's, that's all we care about. The most thing we care about the most is the safety of the crew. Um, so seeing that the automated flight plan can go as expected is great uh, because we are also training the flight crews to be able to take over should there ever be any issues uh, if, if they need to. And Jim, when you when you look at some of the uh, at some of the other aspects of, of this flight, um, you know the brilliant launch yesterday, and how how tough uh, how tough was it for the team to execute some of those demonstrations that were performed? Was that a problem at all, or did the spacecraft really perform the way it was uh, supposed to? 
you know, once we've got, once we have the spacecraft in a stable orbit, uh, we've been able to perform the demos uh, just like we planned, just at a slightly different orbit. Um, so being able to test the propulsion systems, uh, looking at the, the vision, the navigation system, being able to check out the star tracker, which is telling the vehicle where it is relative to the stars, relative to the sun. Um, all of those things have been working just as planned, and the flight control team uh, has been able to follow the flight plan for each of the demos exactly as we wanted to do it. Uh, so every, all the systems have been working nominally since then um, and, and doing everything we need to, do to, need to do to check out the vehicle for crewed flight. And I guess coming up will be another big demonstration with Starliner making its way back to Earth. Exactly. Can you walk us through some of the events that, that, we'll, be, that we'll be seeing over the course of the deorbit and landing? Sure. So we are going to do a deorbit burn, which is going to take the Starliner uh, at the altitude that it's at and lower it, uh, lower the future altitude so it actually comes into the atmosphere. Uh, where it comes into the atmosphere is a place called entry interface. Uh, once the spacecraft enters the atmosphere, it is then going to start controlling itself uh, by doing turns um, and firing its thrusters to keep the spacecraft um, coming down towards our preferred landing zone uh, in, in at White Sands. And so while the spacecraft is maneuvering, it can change how far left or right it's going to go. It can change how far or how close it's going to come down on the ground. Um, and all of those things that are going to be done by the automated flight system. Uh, once we have come through the atmosphere and slowed ourselves down enough, we're actually going to fire some some drogue parachutes uh, to slow the vehicle down. From there, we'll pop out the heat shield, uh, pull out the airbags, and then we'll pull out the main parachutes to come down on a nice soft landing in West in White Sands. And Jim, you know, um, we had the uh, the early difficulty with the mission elapsed timer, um, and it's it's really all the teams have been working very hard since then and of course uh, none of the past uh, couple of days have, have been um, you know have been the teams have been working the whole time give us a little bit a uh, little bit more insight we touched on this earlier but give us a little bit more insight into uh, into what that evaluation process has been and and uh, you know y'all are dealing with a uh, lower orbit than expected but it is still something that uh, is manageable am I understanding that correctly Correct. So Starliner is designed to fly um, anywhere in low Earth orbit. So the fact that we are at a slightly lower than planned orbit um, does not mean the vehicle can't perform um, like a spacecraft that can automate that can fly automated on its own. Uh, so the, the processes we've been going through um, work the exact same way as if we were at a slightly high, slightly higher orbit. It just that we have a um, you know we go around the Earth a little bit faster because our added, our altitude is a little bit lower. Um, but the teams have been able to operate the spacecraft using the exact same commanding, uh, the exact same plan for the order of things that they're going to do than they would have done for the normal mission profile. And I guess uh, it will have just a little bit shorter journey. Normally it takes about, what, 45 minutes for uh, Starliner to get down after its deorbit burn, but it's a little closer to 30 this time? That's correct. Uh, that just has to do with how long it takes from the deorbit burn uh, for the altitude to slowly come down because our trajectory is no longer a, a circular trajectory around the Earth. It's going to be coming down in a, in a, a lower path. And we can see from our monitors here in Mission Control that uh, Starliner is uh, going through the orientation steps ahead of this deorbit burn that's coming up in just a few minutes. Jim, you've um, you're watching this um, you're watching this closely. What are you thinking so far? Everything's looking good right now. Uh, we've got the vehicle pointed where we need to to do the deorbit burn. Um, you know, it looks like the flight control team is all happy. Uh, GNC, you know, my background from school, I, I, I'm happy now because. Uh, that's the type of thing that I really studied for. So um, we're looking good for the deorbit burn. We're hearing here in Mission Control that uh, the Starliner is on its way to burn attitude, burn attitude now. So that'll be getting us in, in place for the deorbit burn coming up uh, just uh, seven minutes and seven minutes and thirty seconds from now. And at this point, Starliner is crossing below Australia on its uh, on its way. Um, over the Pacific. It is going to uh, fly back on what is called an ascending node, which basically means it's coming up from south to north on this pass, going over uh, Baja, California, and uh, then over uh, New Mexico on its way to White Sands.
part of the uh, part of the team here, of course, that's been working throughout this mission, uh, the flight directors, they each have their own teams, and uh, the on-orbit team is led by Bob Dempsey. Bob Dempsey is an uh, astronomer at, at first and has, is a veteran flight controller for um, for Space Station and now for Starliner. Here's a look at, uh, at Bob Dempsey. That NASA was doing, you know, uh, space shuttle, probes around Jupiter, and stuff like that. Um, but when I came here and became a flight director, I realized it's not the technology, it's the people. My call sign, and therefore my team name, is Galileo Flight. Um, that's an homage to the fact that I'm, I'm, by training, an astronomer, so I had that heritage coming in here, um, always interested in exploring. When the chief of the flight director's office called me, uh, I was uh, very surprised. Um, you know, of course, I'd applied and hoped to be selected, but I really thought the odds were, were pretty limited because it's, it's a... It's a small contingent of people. In fact, there's been less flight directors than astronauts um, in the history of NASA. And as we mentioned, Richard Jones is back on console today to bring us in for a landing. Here's a look at what he had to say. The role of the flight director, to put it simply, the flight director makes decisions. I make decisions. And as the mission is continuing, whatever timeline that we're following, whether it's pre-launch, ascent, on orbit, docked, uh, during entry, uh, a lot of questions come up in terms of how we want to proceed because sometimes the script isn't always written for whatever we're doing at the time. We may suffer a failure. Uh, we may have to react to different priorities, whatever is changing. And so the flight director's role is to um, take all of that information in, and uh, all of the, uh, the systems information, the human element, if uh, astronauts are in that vehicle, and make a decision on how to proceed or not to proceed. Sometimes the answer is not to go forward with something. Uh, so it's, it's really just about decision. Other members of our star team of flight directors are Ed Van Size, who was covering the uh, the what we call the third shift, and also uh, Mike Lammers, who is sitting with Richard Jones today. He's been kind of the weather flight director for both launch and landing. Also, um, at the flight control console, you've got a couple of Capcoms on uh, on uh, shift with us. We have uh, Tracy Caldwell, Dyson, and Josh Cassida. Josh is uh, actually scheduled to take his own uh, flight on this Starliner that is currently in space now. He'll be on the second crewed flight of Starliner. Each of those... Each of those teams spent about nine hours in mission control at a time, with one hour on either end of the shift devoted to handover for the oncoming team. And together, these teams have seen Starliner safely through the mission thus far, put it in the best configuration for a successful landing coming up uh, in uh, just 37 minutes now. 37 minutes down to New Mexico. The uh, GNC position here reports that uh, Starliner is in the correct attitude. For its deorbit burn that is coming up at this at this point, the uh, service module and the crew module are both still attached to each other. It will be the uh, service module's OMAC engines, four of them, the orbital maneuvering and control engines, that will uh, power the deorbit burn. They are each 1,500 pound class thrusters, meaning that uh, this 55 second burn will be about uh, 6,000 pounds of thrust. That will uh, slow. Starliner from its current orbital velocity and let it uh, fall into the atmosphere and ultimately fly uh, fly to New Mexico and touch down in White Sands. The Zomax are just about done with their uh, their duty for this mission, but they will also help us uh, move the um, the service module away from the crew module once the two of them uh, disconnect after after the deorbit burn. That burn's coming up in just a little over two minutes now. Everything uh, still still looking good here in the room. Everyone quiet, working through their last steps to get ready for it. 
And after the deorbit burn, we'll be looking at a uh, what is called entry interface, which is basically the point at which the uh, hottest part of atmospheric reentry begins. This is the point when Starliner's heat shield will be uh, will face its biggest test. It's going to get up to uh, 3,000 degrees, and and the plasma will form around the spacecraft. The heat shield is going to provide a, a barrier to that. It's an ablative heat shield of Boeing's design and that's going to protect Starliner and all of its systems. That's a lot to protect it from. 3,000 degrees is uh, almost 1,000 degrees hotter than lava, so it's got quite a job ahead of it, and all that takes place about 75 miles above Earth. So we are about a minute 13 seconds away from the uh, deorbit burn here. Watching this will be uh, Starliner's 33rd orbit of the Earth that this, uh, that this return is happening on. Thirty seconds to go now until the deorbit burn begins. Again, it'll last about fifty-five seconds in all. Ten seconds to deorbit burn. Eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. The orbit burn in progress. Good control reported. Four OMAC thrusters firing for about 55 seconds to slow Starliner down to begin its return to orbit. All looking good thus far. Forty seconds in, about fifteen more to go. Starliner, we can see, is maintaining its attitude. Uh, Mac thrusters are firing. Smaller RCS thrusters are keeping the spacecraft in its position. Good burn reported. Engines cut off. We are on our way to White Sands. Richard Jones tells his team. Starliner's ready to come home now. Next up, as we were just talking about, is the entry interface. That'll be coming up in about 16 minutes. But before that, uh, Starliner does want to get rid of uh, the service module so that this, this command mo uh, the crew module can make its way home on its own. That clears the way for that uh, heat shield and eventually the parachutes that will, that will lower Starliner down slowly to Earth. So Starliner is on a path coming home now. Its uh, speed is dropping, and we will soon be will soon be jettisoning the uh, service module as noted. But we are definitely on the way home to White Sands. Moving into attitude to get rid of the service module now. And flight controllers report that we are in the right attitude and service module has jettisoned. Crew module is flying on its own. Service module will be disposed of while it re-enters over the Pacific. While the crew module continues on a flight path to White Sands, New Mexico, where our Boeing and NASA teams are waiting to recover. Right now it's up to the reaction control system on the crew module to flip uh, the crew module back around get its heat shield pointing into what will soon become a very hot spot. Make sure it's ready for re-entry.
At Starliner Mission Control in Houston, we continue to monitor the progress of Starliner as it flies back to White Sands, New Mexico. All systems are looking just like they're supposed to. Everything is looking good. The crew module is positioning itself for the re-entry. We have entry interface coming up in 13 minutes, 40 seconds. And another Starliner engineer joining us this morning is Tori Wills Pedrotti. You might remember from our launch coverage a couple days ago. Tori is a, an expert on the uh, heat shield of Starliner and many of the other systems. Tori, what are you thinking? What are you thinking right now as uh, as we proceed towards this reentry with uh, with Starliner in a good attitude and heading over the Pacific on the way to White Sands? So thanks, Steve. This is this is a really exciting morning, right, for Starliner to be able to show not only a good SM separation, but also a good attitude coming down into White Sands. So this is just a really good place to be in for the vehicle, and it's going to be upcoming here soon. Then we're going to get to test the heat shield. Um, we have tested that heat shield here in the atmosphere uh, at Ames with NASA a couple different times in an arc jet. Uh, which is really cool and as close as we can get to those really hot atmospheric temperatures on Earth, but there's nothing like a flight test to prove the safety and reliability of something as important as the heat shield. And now that we are, let's see, 11 and a half minutes away from uh, from beginning to experience entry interface, it's, it's really coming down to the to the crunch time. Yeah, it is. And again, this is just really exciting and it's going to be a really good test of that heat shield. Now. A good thing to remember about the heat shield is that it's a game of threes. So the heat shield is going to see about 3,000 degrees at entry interface, and it's going to convert that heat to about 300 degrees on the interior of that um, inner mold line with about three inches of ablator. So it's a really great technology that Boeing has developed, the Boeing lightweight ablator that we have on the vehicle. So it's, it's really exciting to be able to test it here. And also, we have seen some successful parts of this test already. During pad abort, we saw a very successful base heat shield jettison, which happens at about 3,000 feet. So some parts of this we've already seen, but right now we're just really looking to see how the ablator performs during this uncrewed flight test. Hopefully it'll all go just as expected. Um, assuming that uh, we're, we're back, it does go ex expected we're back next time with crew on board, what would they be feeling at this point? So at this point, from a thermal perspective, they would not be feeling anything different than what they would feel during the rest of the rest of the trip. The interior of the vehicle is around 70 to 75 degrees and is very comfortable for the crew. It's all in the exterior of the vehicle that they would that you would see those really high heat wave those heat loads. They would be seeing a very cool light show outside of their window right now as some of that that thermal effects start to take place and you start to see the aero heating uh, sphere occur around the vehicle. And Tori, the, uh, the heat shield for Starliner, of course you have the base heat shield, which is the main thing that we're talking about, but the, uh, the whole vehicle has, the, has a thermal protection, is that right? Yes, that's correct. So uh, the quilted looking blanket that is on the top of Starliner that has that gray color is, act is actually a type of thermal protection system, a TPS. So that is a thermal blanket made out of a bunch of different uh, layers and thicknesses of a quilted material that is actually sewn together and then um, epoxied onto the outside of Starliner. And while those that, that part of the vehicle will not see the high heat that the base heat shield will, 
that gray color and the density of that TPS still protects the vehicle, not only from the high heat of reentry, but also from the really cold temperatures when we're on orbit. So both of those are important when we think about thermal protection systems. Outstanding point, Tori. At Starliner Mission Control, we are 8 minutes 50 seconds away from entry interface, which is the point at which Starliner starts to encounter the hottest parts of reentry. Starliner is in its current uh, is in the proper attitude currently. Its base heat shield pointed in its direction of travel. Tori entry interface. It's something you've been looking at for a long time, and now we're coming up to it. Yes. So when we did analysis on the heat shield, and when we were designing and you know testing it, entry interface is really when we would start caring about the thermal loads the heat shield would see. Before that, the heat shield is protected by the SM because. We don't want it to be affected by any micrometeor debris or anything like that. So having the SM cover the heat shield is really important until we're ready to use it because we want it to be at the exact thickness that we analyze to so it's able to perform its job to the best of its ability. Can you give us an idea of how how precisely that analysis goes? Yes. So each area of the heat shield is actually lofted. So if you look at the heat shield as, you know, it, as a layer of like a grid, each point on that grid is at a different thickness to be able to cover um, all of the heating that we would see during multiple different um, reentry trajectories, but also able to have it as thin as possible to be as lightweight as possible. So we really worked to um, make the heat shield the most efficient it could be while also being as the lightweight as it could be so that we're able to carry more cargo or more crew uh, to station when we eventually go there. <laughs> well, how long after entry interface would you say that the heat shield has kind of done its job? When, when will you sigh with relief? So when we release the drogue parachutes, at that point, the heat shield has taken the brunt of the heat forces. And by the time that we're ready to release those drogues, the heat shield has done almost all of its work. We performed analysis all the way up until the heat shield will actually drop at about 3,000 feet. But once we start releasing those parachutes, I'm going to have a big old sigh of relief. Now, uh, when the vehicle comes back and if we get any shots of that, the ablator is going to look black. It's going to be charred. It's going to have that sort of crusty looking appearance. And that is exactly what we expect because uh, when how an ablator works is it transfers heat into gas. And by doing that, it chars the material. So when the material is, uh, when it's new and when it hasn't seen any heat yet, it's white. But if we see it's black as it's coming back, that means that it actually worked and we've transferred that heat into gas. And Tori, you're of course uh, an, an expert on another Starliner system, the interior camera system. And we have, of course, uh, have had a lot of uh, a lot of interest on that. But but as we understand it, um, we think we'll be able to uh, to have those interior views uh, of Rosie and the commander seat um, throughout from from this mission. Yes, that's correct, Steve. So uh, the interior system for the camera, uh, for OFT, it's recorded, almost, it was supposed to record the entire flight. We definitely got all of the uphill. And then uh, when we got into our orbit and we were stationary, we did have to do some powering down. So the camera system was powered down for a short amount of time, but then it came back on and we powered it back on as we started to do uh, reentry. So we'll be able to see Rosie and Snoopy, not only um, on the uphill ride and as we orbit a little bit, but also during this reentry. So that's going to be really valuable engineering data for the teams to be able to see how Rosie is affected as well as using her sensor data. But also it's going to be great to be able to show the American public what sort of ride they expect. We have four cameras in the vehicle um, and one, one of those is actually pointed out the window. So you're going to see some really cool uh, hopefully views of the earth and then um, you know that that heat that we expect around the heat shield during reentry. So excited to, to get that off the vehicle when it gets home. It's an exciting time. We did have a Starliner Performance deorbit burn at 6.23 a.m. Central today, putting it on its journey back towards a landing in New Mexico just 20 minutes away from now. Um, we'll be coming up on that entry interface that we've been talking about in about four and a half minutes, but we'll keep talking with Tori for a little longer. So Tori, speaking of the camera system, um, it's of course made for uh, made for the crew. That's going to be 
flying this same vehicle after PCM. And, of course, before that, there'll be the uh, crewed flight test mission with uh, Boeing astronaut Chris Ferguson and NASA astronaut Nicole Mann and uh, Mike Fink. Um, what are what are some of what are some of the models that you followed before for um, for really what the crew wants to uh, for what the crew wants to show what uh, what's important to them to be seen? So we designed this camera system extensively working with Chris Ferguson and making sure that he was comfortable with the views and also with. Um, with how close and up, up close and personal we would be inside the crew cabin. So that sort of data that we're going to be able to get from four different camera views on the interior of the Starliner is going to be really valuable to training astronauts in how to use our systems down the road and also to sharing the Starliner story with the public. Now for CFT, we're going to have some enhanced capability. Uh, we're going to be able to show uh, docking live through the ISS. You'll be able to see the hatch opening ceremony and the crew um, greeting the ISS crew for CFT. So that sort of being moments of being able to capture is not only important for the crew, you know, to be able to to understand how the systems work and to be able to train others past them, but also to just to be able to share the story and and show everyone, you know, that we've had a successful docking. Thank you, Tori. We are less than three minutes away from Starliner's entry interface with the atmosphere, two minutes, 43 seconds. This puts us at 18 minutes, 31 seconds from landing at White Sands, New Mexico. We're already beginning to see the, uh, the altitude drop for Starliner really steadily, about uh, 95 miles above the Earth right now and, uh, and, and quickly falling. Flight Director Richard Jones and his team of mission controllers are monitoring every moment of this. Currently, Starliner reports 147,000 feet. Moving under the Mach 25 orbital velocity, currently 24.6 Mach. And at Starliner Mission Control in Houston, we are 40 seconds. We are 40 seconds uh, away from entry interface. Now 34 seconds. Starliner continues in the proper attitude. Altitude 127,000 feet. Uh, 127,000 meters. Apologies. 126,000 meters. And we are right, uh, right on top of that entry interface. This is when Starliner would be seeing those 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit temperatures. Uh, should be just about 75 miles above the Earth at this point. We did want to make sure, uh, as, as people are tuning in, that they are aware that following uh, Starliner's touchdown, we will be posting a post-landing news conference here on NASA TV at 9 a.m. Central Time. That's going to feature Jim Bridenstine, the NASA Administrator, uh, Jim Tilton from Boeing, and Steve Stitch from our Commercial Crew Program.
And Starliner is a minute into entry interface into that phase of maximum heating during this uh, re-entry back over the Pacific. Starliner is flying as a crew module alone. The service module has been jettisoned and disposed of. Altitude 104,000 meters. The entire team here in the room is uh, quietly watching, making sure all the systems continue to look good. We've also got a number of uh, VIPs in the viewing room as well. Um, we've got uh, NASA's uh, Administrator Jim Bridenstine as well as uh, Boeing's uh, Jim Chilton and uh, the, the Boeing Defense and Space CEO Leanne Carrot as well. And we are seeing now on the uh, landing track here in Mission Control as uh, as Starliner moves over the Pacific. Starliner is 13 minutes, 27 seconds from landing at White Sands Space Harbor, New Mexico. Starliner is entering the uh, expected blackout region when the plasma forms over the uh, spacecraft and uh, the antennas cannot uh, adequately communicate with the uh, overhead satellites. Currently 51 uh, miles above the Earth, still heading in, making its way through that entry interface about three minutes into it at this point. The next uh, Next milestone we'll be looking for is the forward heat shield jettison. That should be coming up uh, in uh, less than 10 minutes now. Controllers report good attitude, good roll to the uh, to position it needs to be in. Starliner at 75,000 meters. Starliner moving through Earth's atmosphere, going through the uh, entry phase. 11 minutes, 30 seconds to landing at White Sands, where a team of specialists are waiting to recover the vehicle. This vehicle will be reused after this mission. It will be taken to the Starliner factory in Florida and refurbished, and then flown on the first operational It will be flown, um, slated for the first operational mission. <laughs> Five minutes into entry interface, we are now 10 minutes, 34 seconds before landing at White Sands, New Mexico. Starliner is controllers report the spacecraft is in good attitude. About five minutes away from when we expect that forward heat shield jettison, the first of the heat shields that will be jettisoned. In the meantime, we've got uh, 10 minutes until landing, and the Starliner will be heading in the next few minutes over the Baja Peninsula, part of Mexico, and then into New, New Mexico in the White, Han White Sands Space Harbor. 
And we have confirmation that the uh, on-site vehicle at White Sands, the tracking vehicle, is tracking Starliner right now. Systems are looking good. Nine minutes, 30 seconds to landing. And FIDO reports that Starliner is on track, continuing its descent to White Sands, New Mexico, altitude 51,000 meters. That's about 32 miles above Mexico at the moment. We're getting our first yeah. views. We are getting our first views from the NASA WB-57. We see, we see their Starliner continuing its plunge through the atmosphere. We are eight minutes and eight seconds from landing. That image is infrared because of it being uh, dark, of course, over the skies of, uh, of New Mexico right now. Still about 28 miles above the Earth as it continues making its way, uh, just about crossing over the New Mexico border now. This video again coming from uh, one of NASA's WB-57 planes using infrared camera. All systems are reported doing well. Spacecraft is doing well. Altitude 41,000 meters. Seven and a half minutes till landing and just a couple minutes now until we should hear about the uh, forward heat shield jettison. Great view here. You can't see much since it's dark, but uh, it's good to know that Starliner is on its way home. And, and uh, this is actually a little, little better than I was hoping, considering that it's in the middle of the night in New Mexico. Very good to see this. Very good to see this. Everything is looking. Uh, that, that image is exactly what we expect. The thermal protection system on Starliner, of course, protecting the spacecraft from the heat of, uh, of entry. Slowing speed down now Mach 3.5. Of course orbital velocity is Mach 25 so that gives you an idea of uh, the velocity change. Now 17 miles above New Mexico. Six minutes to landing at White Sands, New Mexico. Starliner remains in its proper attitude, proper course. Speed Mach 1.1, 19,000 meters. Landing recovery team has visual on Starliner as it comes down.
10,000 feet. It's about 6.2 miles still above New Mexico, but uh, we did just to forward get heat shield deploy. Confirmation of that forward heat shield deploy. Everything. Drogues out. Things will happen fast now. The drogues will start stabilizing the Starliner and slowing it down before the main heat shields deploy after it. Main parachutes, rather, not heat shield. Vehicle is slowing rapidly. Mach point two. And landing site reports the sonic booms as Starliner came over. And we can see on that image the uh, the two pilot shoots, the two drogue shoots. Three minutes, 30 seconds from landing. Mains deployed. And we see three main shoots, three main shoots. Billowing up, we have three main shoots. We see the red, white, and blue as Starliner descends. Two minutes, 53 seconds from touchdown. And the rotation handle has deployed. That will level Starliner as it descends. Base heat shield has jettisoned. That is the base heat shield falling away as planned. Airbags are inflating. And that is the last of the milestones. So now all that's left is for Starliner to float down to the surface of the desert in New Mexico. Everything continuing to look good uh, on this uh, camera that we're getting from the WB-57 uh, cameras, infrared cameras, um, giving us a, a, as good a view as we could expect at nighttime. Two minutes, 12 seconds to landing. Starliner descending under three good main chutes. All six airbags are confirmed to have deployed and they are fully inflated as Starliner descends to the desert down in White Sands. Just about 800 meters left to go. It's less than half a mile. Great, great imagery there of it, uh, of it descending. Less than one minute to landing, less than one minute to touchdown at White Sands, New Mexico. Starliner floating smoothly and softly under three main parachutes. Just 300 meters left to go. That's uh, 984 feet. Very close now. 20 seconds. 20 seconds to landing the first Starliner flight test vehicle.
And Starliner touches down in the desert in New Mexico. An historic landing in White Sands, New Mexico, concludes the first flight test of Boeing Starliner spacecraft, the first time an American-made, human-rated capsule has landed on land. That took place right at uh, 6.58 a.m. Central Time, two days, one hours, and 21 minutes into Starliner's mission. Congratulations, Starliner. Congratulations, indeed. Flawless flight back to Earth. Good landing this morning. Now the uh, spotlight's going to shift a little bit to the landing recovery team waiting for it out there in New Mexico. They have to wait for clearance before they start heading over to the vehicle. But Starliner has touched down at White Sands successfully this morning. Main chutes are jettisoned. That'll keep those chutes from pulling uh, Starliner away as the uh, landing recovery team is looking to make their way toward it. Once again, today's landing time was uh, 6.58 a.m. Central Time or uh, 5.58 a.m. Mountain Time, local for Starliner. That again was two days, one hour, and 21 minutes into Starliner's historic orbital flight test. And Starliner systems have switched to ground mode right now. That means the vehicle is taking the steps it needs. Mission Control remains in command of the vehicle. We will soon see the landing recovery team head out. And we're going now to uh, Boeing's Josh Barrett out with the landing recovery team. Josh, it was a beautiful landing from here. I can only imagine how it is from there. Steve, it was a beautiful landing from here. We had a spotlight on the ground. We could actually see some of those ordnance fires up in the upper atmosphere when that Ford heat shield was deploying. Uh, we could see the strobing light on the vehicle all the way down. And then when those parachutes deployed in the spotlight, it looked almost ghostly as it drifted down and touched down at 558 here. As you can see, we are moving in the convoy right now. Uh, we've got our H2, which is actually the connection that I'm talking to you guys back from right now, uh, right in front of us. Uh, our recovery operations leader, we call him Roll. He's in contact with the re recovery operations coordinator. That's rock and roll for you. They are leading us out to the crew module. Um, I can actually see it strobing out in the distance on the horizon. Uh, we have the GPS coordinates locked in. Uh, that strobe is still going on, so we're just going to follow that all the way into the crew module. And then once again, Gold Team will be the first to approach the vehicle. We heard the radio call that there's no hazardous conditions for the LRT, that's the landing and recovery team. Um, but we still want to make sure that everything is safe before the teams get around the vehicle. So again, Gold Team is going to approach the vehicle, uh, sniff out, make sure there's no residual hydrazine on the outside, or there's no propellant leaks. Silver Team is going to go in and discharge the vehicle, and then Green Team is going to go, go in and start uh, getting that environmental closure around uh, the vehicle and um, get some ground heating to it because it's so cold. We want to make sure those propellant lines don't freeze, and then. Um, the red team moves in, uh, gets access to the hatch, uh, and then uh, I think we'll probably wrap up this broadcast right around hatch closer. When there's crew members in there, obviously we'll stick around until everybody's out. But you know, today getting that hatch open and getting access to the interior is really uh, the final big milestone for the landing and recovery team. You know, over to our east, we're starting to see the sun come up, so uh, hopefully we'll have a little better lighting for you as we get into these operations. But um, you know, just a great feeling out here hearing crew module touchdown on the radios just gave everyone here chills. There's a lot of cheers. Uh, very happy team and they're ready to rock. So back to you guys, Steve. Thank you, Josh. So great to hear that. Uh, Richard Jones, flight director here at Mission Control, said that uh, looks like it's going to be a smooth ride for CFT, judging by how softly and smoothly this OFT vehicle, this orbital flight test vehicle came down this morning. I'm sure the uh, the astronauts on their way to see it will will get their own, their assessments as well. Hopefully, uh, and be just as, enth as enthusiastic as that. I know they're they're excited to be there. Um, just a reminder: we've got a lot of work left for this team here in the in the room. But um, in just a little while, we will be going to a post landing news conference uh, that's going to be at 9 a.m. Central Time. So we've still got a couple of hours to, to follow along with Starliner activities here on the ground, um, but we will be hearing from Jim Bridenstein, Jim Chilton, and Steve Stitch at that time. Again, 9 a.m. Central. And also the uh, 
landing team there in New Mexico, there in White Sands, reports that, uh, quote, we hit the bullseye. So Starliner came down exactly where it was supposed to, right at White Sands, right where it needed to be. It was a spectacular, uh, spectacular entry this morning. And, of course, um, remarkable images coming down as it... Uh, we're also getting our first uh, our first look through the darkness at the uh, Starliner capsule as it sits on the desert floor there in White Sands. This picture is from our this picture is from our landing recovery team as they move out towards the spacecraft. And you heard a little bit earlier from two of our Starliner engineers, Jim May and uh, and Tori Wills Pedrotti. They are standing by in the they are standing by in the studio. Jim and Tori it looked great from here. New Mexico reports it looked good. I can only imagine the uh this the uh feelings that y'all have experienced this morning. Thanks, Steve. It has been an absolutely amazing morning. Um, I'm really trying just to keep it together and not cry um, on live TV. But um, it it is a fulfillment of seven and a half years of work to see this happen and happen so successfully and make it look so easy. So this is this is just an absolutely great morning for me. As, you know, I I, I feel the same way. <laughs> Um, you know, we've been training, it's not just us as engineers, but, um, you know, we've put a lot of work into training all of the flight crew um, and the mission controllers as well. Um, you know, so being able to, to get them ready for this flight um, and have them control the vehicle, command the vehicle to come down safely in the desert um, means good things looking forward for our future crewed missions as well. Yeah, and Jim, it, it's such a great synergy between not only the the technical systems right but also our people systems we had exactly. such great people on console we've had such great people out in the desert and then we also have a, a a really great technical vehicle so like seeing all of these things happen together is because of the team that that really made this happen so it's just excellent to see exactly the team effort's great and for those just joining us about eight minutes ago starliner touched down on the sands of uh, white sands new mexico at uh 6:58 a.m. Central Time, 5:58 a.m. Local Mountain Time, out in uh, out at White Sands. Seeing a replay here of uh, that touchdown again. It uh, everything happened right on time. All the milestones, the heat shield jettisons, the parachutes, deployment, the uh, airbags filling up, uh, everything, everything giving good indications for all of the landing system elements. A lot of uh, a lot of activities, uh, of course, took took place. The spacecraft in control of them during that final descent. Um, Tori and Jim, a lot of things for the spacecraft to do, and it but it went really really well. It looked like from your technical knowledge, um, what do you think? So I, I just have to say that heat shield jettison was one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. Uh, it, it looked really good um, from this end. I'm really excited to see some of the more up close images that I'm sure we're going to get from the ground team and also be able to uh, to really dig into the data from the vehicle now that it's back here on Earth. I, I don't think we could have had a better flight. Yeah, and you know the vehicle, we simulate this reentry, especially with the, the actual flight crews and the mission controllers for the uncrewed flight. Um, but seeing the vehicle you nail the bullseye, um, all of the separation and ordinance events happening exactly when they plan to uh, means that we've done a really good job of, of modeling and planning for our flight with our simulations and the way that we train everybody. Um, so seeing that work just as we plan means um, that we've got a good background moving forward into our future flights. And just a reminder that uh, here, here we are about 10 minutes after landing. And the uh, Starliner landing recovery team is making their way out to the spacecraft. We will hear more from uh, from Josh Barrett and NASA's Dan Hewitt as they uh, as they get closer to the spacecraft. Coming uh, a little bit later, we are talking right now with uh, Boeing's Tori Wills Pedrotti and Jim May, both engineers um, in the Starliner systems. We're also you're also seeing some of the uh, the replays of Starliner's very successful 
very smooth landing this morning in New Mexico. Jim, you have the, um, you worked, uh, you've both of course been working throughout the last couple of days. Um, when did you, uh, Jim, when did you first breathe your sigh of relief as you watched it come down this morning? Um, you know, I don't think I really let myself start deeply breathing until we hit the landing. Um, you know, when the, when the mains came out, the mains were coming down slowly, uh, but you know, you really wanna make sure that the vehicle comes down soft and safely, because um, that means soft and safe for the crew. And so I, once it hit the ground, I let out a deep sigh, um, but a happy one. I mean, this is also just a big moment, right? Because we landed an American capsule on land with a with an airbag system. It's like the first time we anybody has done this. So this is this is just really exciting to be a part of this. Right, and you know, us coming down safely on land means that we're going to have the vehicle safe and ready uh, for Sunny Williams to fly on her next mission. Um, that and you know, that means that we can safely bring back the cargo that we're planning on. Uh, um, bringing back from station on the future flights uh, so we can get the research continuing, you know, immediately after landing. We're hearing that uh, Richard Jones here in the flight control team has handed authority of the vehicle over to the landing and recovery team. Um, for, for, for Tori and Jim, you know, I, I know that you would probably love to be there. What would you be looking for if, if you were able to be on site? So I would probably be in an ATV trying to go pick up my heat shield from uh, from somewhere off in the desert. Now it's going to be really important that we that we pick up parts of the pieces that we jettison because that's how we're going to base our models going forward, right? We've done a lot of analysis on this vehicle, but it's getting that data and seeing those systems now that we've actually gone through reentry, which is really going to put us in a great place for when crew gets on the vehicle. And you know, I've been working on the training systems. Um, and the simulations that we used to train everybody. So specifically, I'm looking to get um, some of the flight data recorder data um, and the data that Rosie the Rocketeer has uh, so we can take what we've learned from exactly how the vehicle flight and turn that back into a better training product for f the future. And speaking of, uh, speaking of Rosie the Rocketeer, um, you know, we, we were expecting before this that uh, that Starliner would be coming down um, about the uh, about the speed of an express elevator and a skyscraper. Is that kind of um, realizing that you're that you're not uh, in the control room? But I mean, is that kind of the way it looked to you? That's the way it yeah. seemed to be. Yes, the landing looked uh, exactly like we uh, had in the simulation. So everything looked great. Nice soft landing for for Rosie. <laughs> Can't wait to to see that. Uh that data, I'm sure. Looks like we're starting to get some clearer pictures out at the landing site as uh, the teams move in. Uh, again, we've uh, just landed in New Mexico about 13 minutes ago, 6.58 a.m. Central. For those who might just be joining, you missed a lot of the good stuff, but we still got a little bit to show you. And one of their first tasks will be to put an environmental enclosure around Starliner. We can see the uh, the images there. That's the uh, infrared views of the landing recovery team convoy of vehicles heading out to meet Starliner. And a quick reminder that we will be going out, we hope to be going out to uh, Boeing's Josh Barrett shortly with the landing recovery team. He's uh, in that convoy of vehicles. He is part of the blue team, as they're known. They're divided into uh, different teams of specialists depending on their tasks for Starliner recovery.
15 minutes after the landing of Starliner out in White Sands, New Mexico. Starliner landed after 33 orbits of the Earth. During that time, it was able to check off a number of uh, mission objectives, although it didn't quite make it to the International Space Station. It was able to prove out some of the, um, the not only the, the launch uh, uh, on the Atlas V rocket and, of course, all the landing systems that we saw in action today, but a number of the uh, systems that would be useful during future rendezvous with the space station. A number of the uh, navigation system demonstrations were accomplished. Mission controllers, of course, uh, executed, executed executed their operations, all while keeping an eye on Starliner. And Starliner, in fact, was able to connect with the International Space, Space Station, though it didn't visit, and uh, teams here on the ground were able to send commands from the station to Starliner. Once again, a reminder that uh, coming up in uh, about an hour and 45 minutes, that we're aiming for 9 a.m. Central Time, we will have that post-landing briefing when we expect to hear from Jim Bridenstine, Jim Chilton, and Steve Stitch. Here in Mission Control, Houston, we've got a number of uh, special guests coming in to say hi who have been watching from the viewing room, uh, including NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstine, uh, the Johnson Space Center Director Mark Geyer. We're starting at high fives here. Uh, lots of excitement and smiles. And this all follows a lot of work by a lot of folks. Also joining Bridenstein, uh, NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstein this morning is uh, Boeing's Leanne Corret and Jim Chilton. They are both uh, congratulating the uh, Mission Control Team here in Houston for the work that uh, went into this morning. And we did mention earlier that the team here in Mission Control handing a, handed authority already over to the uh, landing and recovery team on site with Starliner. So they're able to relax a little bit and uh, start some of the celebrations. And we also have a report from the landing team, quote, the vehicle looks fantastic. We hope to uh, hear more from them coming up soon. We're, we're standing by to, to get some more updates from uh, Josh Barrett, Dan, Dan, Dan Hewitt on site there. And as you can see from the screen, NASA's Jim Bridenstine and Johnson Space Center Director Mark Geyer, joined by Boeing Space and Launch Senior Vice President Jim Chilton and Leanne Corret, who is the President and CEO of, of Boeing Defense and Space. Both Bridenstine Boeing and Chilton defense. will uh, be joining um, us again for that uh, post -la post landing uh, news conference that's coming up at 9 a.m. Central Time, and they'll also be joined by uh, Steve Stitch, who is the deputy director of the Commercial Group Crew Program for NASA. So, as you can probably tell, there's a lot of a uh, lot of happy faces this morning in Houston. There we see Leanne with uh, Flight Director Richard Jones and Mike Lammers and Bob Dempsey. More team members continuing to pile into the room. I don't think the 
the congrats are going to stop anytime soon. It's been 20 minutes now since uh, Starliner landed in New Mexico. That took place again at 6.58 a.m. Central Time or 5.58 a.m. Mountain there in New Mexico. And took place at 7.58 Eastern Time there at the launch site. Once again, we've got a number of VIPs uh, piling into the room, uh, some of them that you might recognize, uh, NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstine, as well as his Deputy Administrator Jim Moorhart and uh, Jim Chilton, a number of Jims in the room today, uh, Chilton's Senior Vice President of Space and Launch for Boeing, uh, also uh, Leanne Corette, uh, Leanne Corette, uh, the Boeing Defense and Space CEO. Uh, Center Director Mark Geyer, and uh, we've got, I think, all of the all of the Starliner flight directors, I believe, in here. Uh, Richard Jones, of course, who uh, was on console for landing and launch, um, as well as uh, Mike Lambers, who was next to him as the weather flight director. Um, also milling around Ed Van Sice and Bob Dempsey, all all uh, taking part in the congrats. Meanwhile, out at White Sands, New Mexico, the landing recovery team is uh, getting closer to the Starliner vehicle. They will be putting an environmental enclosure up over the vehicle. It is, of course, below freezing out in White Sands this morning. And we are seeing some imagery, some uh, regular imagery coming from White Sands, New Mexico, here in the control room. The team, of course, brings a lot of lights with them. And we are hoping to uh, reconnect with the blue team, part of the landing recovery team. We're just waiting for the uh, communications link to be uh, completed. Starliner is in very good shape, landed 23, almost 24 minutes ago. White Sands, New Mexico. And we also have a report from, uh, we have a report from the landing zone con confirming that uh, all the parachutes detached after landing to prevent the parachutes from pulling the vehicle over in high winds. The vehicle is looking good. Is also the report and uh, the landing went very smoothly today. I think, I think the, uh, Team will be very pleased with the way today's deorbit and landing went. 
I want to sneak in another reminder of our upcoming uh, post landing news conference that'll be at 9 a.m. Central Time. That's what we're targeting. Media who are interested in taking part in uh, the in the news conference can call the Johnson Space Center newsroom. That number is 281-483-5111. Again, call the Johnson Space Center newsroom to take part uh, for media to take part in that uh, in that news conference coming up at 9 a.m. Central Time. Again, it'll feature Jim Bridenstine, Jim Chilton, and Steve Stitch. And we are now getting some new views from the landing side. Great view of Starliner there. You can see the detail of the side hatch, the, the, color, the colors outlining the different parts of the spacecraft. And what we're seeing is the uh, first members of the landing recovery team moving out to the vehicle. They are just making sure that the atmosphere, that the environment is safe around Starliner. Starliner, of course, comes back um, through the atmosphere with the maneuvering fuel. It, it jettisons quite a bit of it on the, on the way down, but they do need to confirm before uh, the whole teams get there that the uh, environment is safe for the uh, for the landing recovery team, you can also see in this in this the uh, partially deflated airbags. They of course have vents on them to uh, cushion, just like a car airbag, to cushion the uh, touchdown impact. It's supposed to come down at about uh, 18 miles per hour, I think, right? So, not not nearly as fast as when it starts its journey, but uh, you still like a little cushion there. All indications of the loads on landing are that it was extremely smooth. And again, Richard Jones, Flight Director Richard Jones, his comment was, looks like it's going to be a smooth, a smooth landing when the CFT crew, when the uh, astronauts of the crewed flight test make their flight into space. The next crew that will be on board is out at the landing site. That's uh, NASA's Mike Fink and Nicole Mann and Boeing's Chris Ferguson. They're all going to be uh, getting that first look at Starliner here in just a moment as the as the teams are allowed to move in. We're hoping to hear a little bit from them uh, as uh, as we're able to get uh, Dan Hewitt and Josh Barrett up and running. And one more note about the landing recovery team. Of course, we're going to stay focused on the capsule. There are other t other parts of the teams that go out and recover the uh, base heat shield and the forward heat shield and the parachutes. The spacecraft itself will be taken over to Boeing Starliner factory in Florida and refurbished. The base heat shield does not get reused. And this spacecraft will be used again. It can be reused up to 10 times. This vehicle, of course, comes down on land. We designed it to land on land just to get that reusable ability that you don't get when you splash down in the water. Landing teams continuing to inspect the vehicle.
This administrator, Jim Bridenstine, just wrapping up some encouraging words to the team here in the room. He uh, had a lot to say, starting with congratulations. He said the last 48 hours weren't easy, but the takeaway was a successful test flight. And he pointed out that we've learned a lot from this. We've learned a lot about a lot of different aspects of flying it, of course. And NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstein told the room watching the landing was a thing of beauty today. He was very encouraged by what he saw, reported that uh, a lot of tasks were accomplished during this flight. We learned a lot. That's why you test. And this was a challenge for the flight team because, you, you know, you had to do uh, some of the flying in a non-optimum situation, but they still managed to do a lot of things right and we learned a lot about this vehicle this is the first of the space proven models of the starliner spacecraft we have uh, a crude flight test version back in florida that's being prepared for the crude flight test to uh, carry astronauts and we have a pad abort test vehicle also so it's a the fleet now has a vehicle that has gone orbited the earth 33 times and landed back in new mexico that's a great start. Uh, Bridenstine also mentioned that he uh, called Vice President Mike Pence from this room, and uh, Pence mentioned that he knows uh, that we just made history here. So kudos coming in from, from all over the place at the moment. Uh, we are also uh, able to get uh, one of the first uh, still photographs from our NASA, one of our NASA uh, photographers in the field. Um, we have to show for you here. This uh, came from Aubrey Gimignani, one of our NASA photographers, taken of Starliner making its way down to, to its landing in New Mexico at uh, 6.58 a.m. Central Time. And you can see there that Starliner is the uh, small, small conical shape at the end of the uh, three main parachutes. And in fact, this image comes to, came through of the uh, base heat shield as it jettisoned. Of course, space heat shield protecting it from the 3,000 degrees of uh, re-entry. And uh, then it's work done, it jettisons, and the airbags inflate. Team here in the room is about to uh, take a, a group photo, but uh, before they did, uh, Flight Director Richard Jones gave his flight controllers the go-ahead to uh, consider themselves done with the mission and advise them to go home and relish it. And indeed, they've all the mission controllers have been doing a lot of work during the uh, duration of this mission. Still waiting uh, for our counterparts there on the ground in White Sands to be able to get into position to, to give us another update. We're hoping that will come pretty soon. But in the meantime, I'm going to give you another reminder that we've got a post-landing uh, news conference coming up at 9 a.m. Central Time. That's going to feature uh, NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstine, uh, Senior VP of Space and Launch Jim Chilton, uh, and also uh, the Deputy Director of Commercial Crews, Steve Stitch. They will all be giving us the, the final word on the mission, at least for now. Uh, media who would like to participate can call the Johnson Space Center newsroom at 281-483-5111. Again, that will be targeted to begin at 9 a.m. Central. And while we have Tori wills Pedrotti and Jim May over in the studio, um, Tori and Jim, you're seeing now the visual light imagery coming in from White Sands. We see the uh, landing recovery team, the first elements getting close to the vehicle, but you've seen the details of the hatch, the details of the upper structure. What are you thinking as you see this? You know, the, the vehicle looks clean, um, meaning we had a great reentry uh, profile, just like we planned. Um, and, you know, you see the vehicle sitting there on its inner airbags cushioned off the ground. Uh, meaning we've got um, our analysis on the landing recovery system um, seems to be great. So the vehicle is in safe hands now on the ground. And I have to say that 
I am I am very impressed with the way that, that that the heat shield performed, but also looking at this and looking at how we landed, I think it's uh it's going to be really great for Sunny's first ride here in uh, for PCM1. So that reusability of that capsule is is critical for us, and that's great to see such a clean landing. Sunny's crewmate Josh Cassidy stopped by uh, our console here in Mission Control just a moment ago, just giving a thumbs up. He looks super excited and I think ready to get on board. And we can see there members of the landing recovery team moving around the vehicle, doing their checks. We uh, hope to hear from uh, from the blue team, who are right with that uh, landing recovery convoy. And at this point, if you are just joining us, the uh, Starliner orbital flight test ended with a flawless deorbit entry and landing in White Sands, New Mexico. Once again, at uh, this point, we are seeing the Starliner spacecraft safely on the ground in White Sands, New Mexico. This is the first vehicle to land, the first American-made human-rated capsule, I should say, to land on land. Came down under three parachutes, touched down on six inflated airbags, very smooth landing. Touchdown time was 6.58 Central Time here at Mission Control. 558 Mountain Time, the landing site, and 758 Eastern Time, where it launched from. We can see that they're moving the platform into place for on Starliner to uh, get access. And we have Boeing's Josh Barrett at the landing site in White Sands. He is joining us by phone. We're going to stay on this image of Starliner out on the desert floor. Josh, how was it from your side? Hey, Steve. Uh, it looks beautiful looking at Starliner with my own two eyes. 
Uh, we're working on getting some better video uplinks. We have our situational awareness camera up, but we're working on getting our closer handheld cameras up for you. Hopefully we can get that working for you soon. And so you can get some good up close views. Right now the Boeing Fire Rescue Teams are moving the platform in front of the crew module. Green Team is working on inflating the environmental enclosure. That's, uh, if you can kind of see what's going on behind the crew module from the perspective of the situational awareness camera, they're inflating that in between uh, that HVAC trailer there. So you'll see kind of that big inflatable enclosure kind of hug the vehicle and uh, they're going to start getting some heat on there again to make sure those uh, propulsion lines don't freeze. Uh, Gold Team has moved in and done their assessment. Everything is healthy on the vehicle. Silver Team has grounded the vehicle and now they've moved on to recovering the parachutes. Um, there's a beautiful pink orange horizon to the east as the sun is coming up. Uh, really a beautiful day here out in the desert. Although it is still pretty cold, but the teams are working hard. They're working through the cold. Um, next up, you should see the medical truck start to move into place beside that, mo that mobile access platform. Um, that is just an exercise for today. That medical truck won't be used today. Um, the crew is actually just getting out of the, the trucks in front of me here. You might see them start uh, appearing in the SA camera in their pink vests. Um, but really, just overall a, a great morning. Uh, this team is executing exactly what they have trained for over and over and over again. Uh, and um, hopefully we can get some better views as our, as our camera guys move in a little closer. We're trying to reestablish a microwave link to our satellite feed. Uh, we think maybe on the drive out here, one of our connections might have got jostled out. But we, we want to get you some better views soon, but we're glad you're getting a look at Starliner on the ground. Uh, so I'll let you guys take it from here. Thank you, Josh. This has been an exciting morning, certainly certainly one that, uh, that we've not seen before with an American human-rated capsule touching down on land. I can't, I can't hear you. We can see the environmental enclosure being put into place. They're going to put that over the Starliner vehicle, as Josh just mentioned, and that's going to clear the way to open the side hatch. The environmental enclosure, of course, protects the vehicle and its complex systems from the, uh, from the cold. Of course, Starliner has been through an extreme environment during this uh, deorbit burn, having gone through 3,000 degrees of heat before coming down softly under three main parachutes and landing on six airbags in a flawless return to Earth. Steve, while we wait for hear back more from the um, from the landing team, tell us a little bit about how uh, Starliner gets back to Florida. What what is that journey like? Well, they'll move. Uh, they'll basically after they get Starliner safe on the ground, they will um, they will put it on a on a truck inside a uh, crate that'll control the environment around it, and then it's a simple drive from White Sands, New Mexico, to uh, Cape Canaveral, Florida, to Kennedy Space Center. Sure, that sounds simple. Where the um, where the engineers will uh, pour through it and ultimately refurbish it, and we're going to fly it again. We are not only using these capsules one time. Each of these capsules is designed for ten times to go in space. We look forward to seeing this one land on its tenth time then. And it sounds like we have uh, Josh ready again to give us another update. Josh, can you hear us? Hey, Brandy. Yes, I'm still here. Uh, you can see the green team has just got that environmental enclosure in place. So now the red team will continue backing up that mobile access platform right up to the hatch. Uh, they'll extend a little bit of, of that, almost touching uh, the hatch, but we don't want to make contact with the vehicle and potentially damage the thermal protection system. Because uh, as you guys just mentioned, this vehicle will be reused. Uh, thermal protection system needs to be uh, maintain integrity. Uh, we will replace the Ford heat shield and the base heat shield. Actually, uh, the Ford heat shield landed probably about 600 feet away from the capsule. I'm looking at it right now. It landed on its nose. Um, haven't 
found the base heat shield yet, but uh, I'm sure it's around here somewhere. Um, the crew, you can see that that's the astronaut crew in their pink vests. Now, uh, you might not have heard me about talk about pink team. Pink team is just uh, kind of the observers. They don't have an operational role, um, but they are in brightly colored pink vests just to make sure, uh, you know, they're visible and uh, the operational teams kind of uh, avoid them. <laughs> Or they avoid the operational teams and don't don't uh, get in the way of the operation. But um, again, that environmental enclosure, they're just kind of adjusting it a little bit right now to give red team access to the hatch. Uh, there you see the mobile access platform backing ever so slowly. They're very, being very careful not to damage that thermal protection system. Josh, have you had a chance to talk with any of the astronauts? Get any of any of their thoughts on watching the landing? I have not. They uh, got out of the car and walked straight up to the vehicle while we're trying to get this video link back up for you guys. But I will be sure to grab them as soon as I can. Understandable that they want to hurry over. Yeah, I know. Uh, I know Josh is back in Houston watching, and Sunny's here, and. Uh, I'm sure she's extremely pleased seeing her ride back on Earth safely, you know, executing a pretty flawless landing. Three, two drogues, three main parachutes, six airbags. That's what we want to see every time. And Josh, how does this look compared to what we saw after the uh, pad abort test? Uh, so I, I um, was honestly expecting a little bit of a kind of thermal scorch marks almost on the vehicle, but it looks almost as good as the day it left the factory in Florida. Um, it was, you know, even the, all of the logos, the NASA logo, the Boeing logos, kind of the, the hash marks we have around the top where the Ford heat shield meets the vehicle, those are all 100% perfectly intact. Um, now you can see the, the medical trucks starting to back up. So we actually uh, custom designed those medical trucks. Those were surplus Army five-ton trucks. Um, and we kind of outfitted it with uh, that platform you might be able to see on the back of the truck, and the interior was completely refitted to be a um, pretty state-of-the-art field medical facility. So once again, when the astronauts come out of the hatch, uh, they're uh, going straight into that medical truck just to make sure that they're healthy after spending an extended time in orbit. Um, once again, you see the red team establishing access to the hatch. Once they lower that, uh, lower those stairs, uh, Selena Dopart, one of our human factors engineers, will go up and actually open the hatch. She's actually, I can see her standing uh, to the left of the platform uh, with the hard hat on. And Josh, I know just like, um, tell us a little bit about some of the uh, practice stuff. This is what I'm getting at is just like the flight control team does simulations, just like the launch team does simulations, the landing team has walked through this a number of times out in White Sands, correct? Yeah, they have done it about four or five times as a full team, and that's four or five separate times when the whole, uh, you know, the fire rescue teams come from Charleston, Seattle, uh, a lot of the major, you know, California, a lot of the major Boeing facilities across the country, and then the Starliner program teams come from uh, Houston and Florida mostly. So they have taken over the past couple of years four or five times. They all come together and run through these exercises, and then individually each team kind of practices their routines uh, multiple times throughout the year, make sure everyone stays fresh, knows exactly what they're doing. Um, pretty delicate operation. And, uh, you know, there's some very time-critical elements to it, especially when we get crew on board. This time, it's, since it's the first time the team is actually doing it for real, we're taking our time. Uh, there's not crew inside, but we do have a requirement to get crew out of the vehicle an hour after touchdown. Um, but this time, the vehicle landed and powered itself off. And uh, so that kind of gave the team plenty of time to make sure that they're doing this right. They're doing it deliberately and intentionally. And, uh, you know, really the biggest time critical thing was getting that environmental enclosure over the vehicle and uh, heating it up a little bit in this kind of frigid desert air. And, Josh, we do have a, um, we do have a report uh, that goes along with your uh, no scorch marks observation there. 
the reentry cabin heating was notably lower was a notably lower change in temperatures, which indicates a better than expected performance of the reentry system. That is um, that's really good news, and I think uh, I think this is going. It sounds like it's going to uh, make it an easier refurbishment operation. You're the one who uh, is out there in Florida all the time with the uh, with the factory and with the refurbishment. Does that uh, does that make sense to you? Yeah, I, I actually, it'll be really great to see this vehicle back in Florida because right now we have our other two spacecraft, the paddleboard vehicle is in the factory as well as the crew flight test vehicle. And, you know, back when I first joined the program about two years ago, it was really awesome seeing three vehicles in flow. So when this comes back to Florida and they start processing it for Sonny and Josh's flight plus the two international astronauts that are assigned to the vehicle, um, it'll be nice to see. It'll be kind of like getting the family back together. I bet a lot of people are, are going to be excited to see it back in Florida. Yeah, that's right. And, uh, you know, in the, the meantime, while uh, we test and process and refurbish this vehicle for the next flight, uh, the crew flight test vehicle is going through kind of final processing right now. Um, the paddleboard vehicle, we actually uh, will not fly that to space, but we will keep it around um, just in case we need any spare parts from it. So uh, that we'll have that in Florida as well for a while. Um, but that was that was really cool seeing it come back. Um, if you watch the paddleboard test, you might have seen the, all the signatures from everyone who worked so hard on it. We couldn't sign this vehicle. Again, the thermal protection system uh, kind of inhibited us from putting Sharpie marker on it. But um, still a beautiful vehicle. It's kind of a shame the environmental enclosures covered it up right now, but again, we're just doing that to make sure the vehicle stays safe and healthy so we can use it again. And Josh, we want you to stand by. We want to go to uh, Tori wills Pedrati, who's one of the engineers who worked with this uh, heat shield. And Tori, you've heard Josh's description of the spacecraft, uh, you know, light, light scorch marks, nothing. It looks a lot like the way it did um, when it went into space. What does that tell you? Ready to go. Okay. Any, you know, anything during landing, but and reentry, but seeing it and hearing that the inside of the vehicle was even better than we expected just is it's such a great feeling to know that we did we not only did our job but better than better than we hoped it would perform so that's uh that's really really good to hear and I think that puts a lot of confidence uh, in these systems going forward. Tori, I think we lost the first part of your question. Can we get you to, to run back over it? Uh, yeah, of course. Um, so I was just saying that listening to Josh and uh, and seeing that the, the vehicle was as clean as it was, and Jimmy and I were talking about it in the studio just a few minutes ago, that the vehicle looks fantastic on the ground there, right? White, clean, way better than uh, than what, what we were expecting to see. We were expecting to see some char marks, maybe a little. Are you calling through the Wi-Fi? So it's, uh, okay. it's, it's really good looking out there, and it really just puts confidence in uh, the analysis that we've done and the models that we have. Jim, does this look the way uh, the way that you expected it to? You know, it looked better than I expected it to. So I was really, I, I was really thinking that we were that we were going to see at least a little bit of scorching right around where the shoulder comes up onto the vehicle, but. Those tiles are in all of the right places, and they look just like they did when they left the factory. So that is that is a phenomenal thing to see. Hey, uh, we're, 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 we got it. Thank you, Tori and Jim. You're seeing uh, yeah, you're hey, seeing all this. You're you seeing what to, the crew is uh, going to see. On, wait, How's this going? Uh, what, what are you thinking right now? So for the crew involvement, um, one, the vehicle looking the way it does means good things for them coming back, okay. but. It yeah, also means yeah, good things back. for the parts on the inside of the spacecraft they're going to reuse and, as well. I mean, get the crew ready so for we well. are going to reuse things like the tablets that we're using to do the crew procedures and also um, using for some of their um, training while they're up on orbit. Things of that nature um, right, that are ahead. inside of the spacecraft um, that are going to be coming back as well are going to be reused on later flights. So that's a good thing seeing the vehicle the way it is. And we are seeing really good imagery now of the... Uh, of the team coming out. Josh, do we still have you out there in White Sands? 
Again, Starliner engineer Selena Dopart working on opening the hatch. So right now she is, uh, she's got a couple of different tools. So the, the hatch seals itself, um, it, it, it's actually a little difficult to open. It's kind of like two suction cups stuck together. Um, and so she's working on what's called burping the seal. So she's kind of opening up a valve to uh, allow a little bit of air into the seal. And hopefully that'll just give her enough uh, enough give to get that hatch open. She's already kind of cranked the latch to unhook it. So she's, again, working on burping the seal right now. Um, if that doesn't quite work, there's another relief valve that she'll kind of use to pop the seal. And uh, that's if they start working on something kind of in the middle of the hatch, that's what they'll be working on. It looks like that might be what they're doing right now. Yeah, she's still working on that lower valve. Again, trying to burp that seal. Yes, that is the technical term. <laughs> that's very descriptive. What, what will happen after that once, once they do have that, that seal burped? So again, if they can, uh, if that gets enough uh, air into that seal, they'll be able to, you know, release the hatch seal, and then they can open up the hatch. So that's what they're working on right now. Um, We're getting really good views right over the shoulder. So these, these are great, Josh. Yeah, I wish we got it a little earlier because the, the fire rescue team, when they're putting that platform into place, I mean, they, they work together so well here and kind of their, their calls as they orchestrate the operation is, is really uh, fun to watch there. We got to they see that like and, and the well. environmental enclosure go on, just not from quite this close. Hopefully for later flights, we'll get all this live. And uh, getting a TV signal out of a remote landing site in the desert presents its own set of technical challenges, but I'm glad we're getting this view right now. Again, this is opening up the hatch. And Josh, we do have confirmation that uh, it appears they've relieved the pressure on the seal. Looks like they're getting close to uh, pulling it open here. All right, well, while they work on that, Steve and Brandy, I'm going to step away. We are going to go find uh, the crew members and hear from them here uh, from their perspective of how that went, and we'll get them on camera um, for you guys here momentarily. We'll stand by. Thank you. And since we are uh, just hitting the top of the hour, I wanted to remind everybody that in about an hour at 9 a.m. Central is our target time. We are planning to have our post-landing news conference that's going to feature NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstine, uh, Boeing's Senior Vice President of Space and Launch, uh, Jim Chilton, and uh, NASA's uh, Deputy Director of the Commercial Crew Program, Steve Stitch. They'll be joining us at 9 a.m. Central Time for a post-landing news conference. Media who want to participate in that can call the Johnson Space Center Newsroom at 281-483-5111. And for those just joining us here at the top of the hour. And we do have views now. The hatch is open. Starliner's OFT hatch is open. Rosie and Snoopy inside. Rosie the Rocketeer and the low gravity indicator Snoopy both made the trip along with uh, along with a lot of commemorative cargo flags coins and even tree seeds that'll be planted in in uh, commemoration of this mission of course a lot of things were learned on this flight it is the first flight test of Boeing Starliner spacecraft ground crews getting their first look inside the cabin And the frame that you saw pushed, pushed
pushed into place there in the hatch is, is actually a cover for those same seals that they were just um, relieving the pressure on before they could open the hatch. And we can see the ground team going through their carefully planned steps as they prepare the spacecraft, putting a cover over that over that hatch that they just opened a few minutes ago. First, they're going to confirm that the cabin air is safe. This flight test produced a lot of data for engineers, a lot of information, and a lot of um, operational process processes to see uh, how it uh, performs in space. And of course, two of the big parts of that are the launch and then the return to Earth. These are very dynamic events, shouldn't be overlooked. And we see right now that Starliner is doing very well this morning. And we have our first landing recovery team engineer about to go inside the Starliner vehicle. Selena Dopart. For those who are just joining us, Boeing Starliner spacecraft touched down in White Sands, New Mexico an hour and six minutes ago. Came down under three main parachutes Touched down on six airbags. Now we see Selena Dopart of the landing recovery team moving into the Starliner vehicle. This mission was without a crew as the first flight test of the vehicle in space. But we do have Rosie the Rocketeer in the commander's seat, an anthropometric test device gathering all sorts of data. She's outfitted with uh, all kinds of instruments that's going to tell us exactly what the crew can expect. Early indications are the crew can expect a really good ride down. And, and we do have reports from the landing recovery team that Rosie the Rocketeer is still strapped in in the commander's seat. While we're standing by on this, we do have another photo uh, that came uh, in after uh, after Starliner's touchdown from our NASA photographers there on the scene. Uh, we've got 
all what comes out of it. We can't do anything to it. Okay, yes, sir. Are we done with it? Just pull it across. Sorry, slight delay there, but there's that uh, photo I was promising. This again taken by the uh, NASA photographers on the scene, and uh, there's uh, the one that uh, we got from Starliner just after it landed at 5, uh, 5.58 a.m. Mountain Time, 6.58 a.m. Central Time. You can see the, that that is right at landing because of the position of the position of the parachutes. Those, photo those photographs coming in from Aubrey Gimignotti, a NASA photographer there on the scene. It really was a, a great view this morning as a Starliner touched down about an hour and 10 minutes ago. Now we're back to live imagery of the landing recovery team. As they look in on the hatch, they are We expect to hear momentarily from the landing team there on site uh, who are, we uh, think are just about to get into place with the uh, next crew to fly on a Starliner, the first crew to fly on a Starliner. NASA's Mike Fink and Nicole Mann along with Boeing's uh, Chris Ferguson. We expect to hear from them uh, just momentarily. I think uh, they're, they're still getting into place, but we're going to hold on and, and, uh, and, and hope to, to get some words from them soon. And just a note on the interior cabin conditions as they were reported. The inside humidity was 51%, temperature internally around 54 degrees. So this spacecraft handled very, very well. In fact, better performance uh, than was anticipated. And we're looking now at some of the astronauts there in the blue pants and their in their astronaut jumpsuits out at White Sands, New Mexico. They flew out to New Mexico to uh, follow Starliner's return to Earth. We see two more coming down, joining the uh, joining the group there within uh, within a few feet of the Starliner spacecraft. So right now we're looking at the uh, astronauts as they as they shuffle around with the landing recovery team. There's a lot of activity out by that capsule. And there's a lot of activity around the capsule. This, uh, this is a little bit reminiscent of the shuttle days when everybody would gather around the uh, shuttle after it landed 
And uh, of course, you have crews come in with the Soyuz landing in Kazakhstan. Yeah, this is a, a little less remote than the shuttle, but a little more remote, than, or not quite as remote as the uh, Kazakhstan landing still. It does start to look familiar, and it looks like we may be getting close to having the crew ready to talk with us. In fact, I'm going to toss it right on to Dan Hewitt, who is in the field. How are you doing, Dan? Hey, uh, Dan, I don't think has his uh, program line working, so I'm going to take it from here. But, uh, you know, we're here with NASA's Nicole Mann, Boeing's Chris Ferguson, and NASA's Mike Fink. Guys, uh, Nicole, I'll start with you seeing, I'm guessing this is your first spacecraft landing. <laughs> this is my first spacecraft landing. It was uh, incredible in seeing. We're so excited for the Boeing and NASA team and the recovery forces today. Just did an incredible job. Crystal clear day. You could see it from about 300 kilometers away. Uh, good double sonic boom. Uh, watched all of the pyrotechnic ordnance that deployed the parachutes, uh, you know, take care of itself on the way down. And we saw it all the way to touchdown, even on a, just a crystal clear but cold morning. Work great. <laughs> and Mike, your initial thoughts? Three parachutes, six uh, um, airbags, and a beautiful soft landing. Can't wait to try it out. So we, we had a flawless launch. We had a couple of issues once we were up there. What's it mean now to see this vehicle come down, you know, almost picture perfect? Flight test data, flight test data, flight test data. We've got a lot of data on the, the launch, the orbital uh, portion of the flight, the ECLIS system, that's environmental control life support. Uh, everything's worked, worked great. And then we brought it home and everything worked. It was, uh, it was great data and we're going to analyze it and, and uh, we're going to see uh, um, anything that we need to fix for the next flight, but it's looking good. Now, Chris, uh, I remember when I was with uh, you down in the simulator in Houston, you talked about how much different this is going to be coming back than the shuttle because you're almost coming in backwards. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I, what really impressed me was, uh, you know, the shuttle sort of uh, glided into the atmosphere, and uh, yeah, at the, at the uh, sort of at the end game, it uh, it was it was pretty steep. This was really steep, so uh, it almost looked like it was going to overshoot the landing site, and at the last minute, you know, gravity sort of took over, and it uh, it pretty much came straight on down. So. Uh, I was a little curious about the boom. We got a nice double boom out of it. I would say it was real loud. But uh, other than that, uh, being able to just watch the entire sequence from the ground on down was uh, was just fantastic. I heard uh, the uh, our radar team picked up lock right over the mountains as it was uh, mountain rise, uh, which is great. I heard that the WB-57 with uh, reconnaissance and and, uh, and telemetry data picked up a lot of uh, a lot as well. So we're going to have a lot to look at. Uh, I think really clean landing. Now, uh, the reason we took a little bit to get you guys over here, we had to go get you away from that base heat shield. You were examining that. You know, Nicole, uh, seeing the, the, the crew module and the heat shields around here, you know, what did it look like seeing the hardware on the ground to you? It was amazing to me. I couldn't imagine that it had just come through the atmosphere at incredible temperatures. It looked like it was in great shape. Um, you could see when it impacted the ground uh, that it had a little damage. But other than that, you know, it really looked uniform and uh, it was in really in great shape. I think we're going to get a lot of great data from recovering this. Well, I know it's pretty cold out here. Um, we might let you guys bundle back up <laughs> and uh, toss it back to you guys, Brandy and Steve, out in Houston. And uh, I want to bundle back up, too. It's freezing. <laughs> Thanks so much, Josh, and great to see the crew out there. And as you can see, we are now joined by uh, Flight Director Richard Jones coming off a great landing. Welcome, Richard. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, how does it feel to be have gotten to this point? Oh, it's a, it's a relief. Uh, but excitement at the same time. You know, it was uh, a lot of people are looking at this mission that uh, we didn't get everything that we should have, but in my eyes, it was a huge success, huge success. And uh, you heard the NASA administrator soon after talking about how much information is coming from this mission. Talk a little bit about some of, some of the things. You, you and your team uh, worked through issues at the beginning, but then you got a lot of stuff done. And of course, today's landing was was just beautiful. Yeah, we, you know, after, we proved clearly the ascent and entry systems worked great, but we also had the opportunity to fly underneath the station, the space station. We made uh, voice communications with them, not necessarily through a voice communication, but we had a, a positive link where we tested commands. Uh, so we got some objectives done. Talk a little bit about your team. You you have you don't do all this by yourself. No, none of, none of us no, do all this by no, ourselves. No, no. no I, I am definitely a, a a part of a one of the most exceptional teams that I've been a part of. You know, it's we we accomplished so much 
uh, with this with this flight. The team members, they every single one contributed in their own in their own way and uh, contributed to the successful outcome of this mission. So I'm very proud to be a part of that. I feel like uh, a lot of the successes are probably due to a whole lot of training on the front end on your side. Yeah, no, we've been training for over a year now. We've had a lot of simulations going through all of these things. And it's kind of built into the flight control elements that we all are trying to hone our skills to do. And, and it's just to uh, perform under the sometimes the face of adversity and perform uh, when everything's calm. So, you know, it's just it's part of what we do. You all seem very calm the whole time. We were right here with you, and it was amazing to us. Well, it was, you know, it's almost like a duck with their feet paddling underwater. We, we were working really hard uh, trying to get through some really difficult uh, challenges, but uh, on the surface, yeah, that's, uh, that's our demeanor. When um, you had, of course, this great seat where you saw all the telemetry of the vehicle as it came down, as it landed, um, looked stable as a table to us, came down soft as could be. You saw the uh, the numbers. How did that look to you? No, the, the data looked, I mean, just great. And, and uh, the, the, we, uh, there was a period during reentry where we had a little bit of a blackout, but it happened exactly where it should have been. Uh, all of the systems were performing exactly like what we predicted. In fact, a lot pre performed better than what we were expecting. And so it was, it was really good to see the vehicle behave the way it did. And we are, uh, we're seeing right now some live views of, of the astronauts getting a look inside the vehicle. Um, I know you had a good seat, but it's hard to compete with that one. No, 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 no. Uh, you're right. I cannot compete with that. It's going to be really exciting to see the CFT crew get into uh, not necessarily this vehicle, but uh, its vehicle, their vehicle that they're going to fly to the space station. It's going to be a great day to see that happen. How do you think Rosie, the Rocketeer, did during this flight? <laughs> I'm sure she did just fine. Um, <clears throat> you know, she got a, a great ride during ascent. The Atlas V performed flawlessly. Um, once we got on orbit, she got to see how the, uh, the, the cabin atmosphere was uh, behaving, all of the systems. She, she probably had, uh, it's, it's like a, a Southwest flight uh, to uh, their home, hometown. It was just that easy. When, um, when you look back at this mission, what, uh, what are some of the days that are going to stand out to you? Oh, every single day. I, you know, it's not more of the days. It was, I, I will look back on this and just remember the people that were a part of it. Uh, there were just so many people, not just in this room, the engineering team, whether they were just down the hall uh, in Florida, the ULA team members that we had, the mission management team meetings that we had, um, it's, uh, it's really special to see so many peoples from different backgrounds just come together and just perform flawlessly. That's what, what I'm going to remember. Getting some good We're getting inside. some of our first images from inside the cabin of Starliner. Richard, you're seeing these fresh just as we are. What are you thinking? Gosh, you know, it looks, I'm looking inside that, uh, that cabin, and it looks like all of uh, the uh, cargo did just fine. It's, uh, I would love to see Rosie just sitting there just to see how, uh, how Rosie did. But, uh, boy, it looks like a, they had a really smooth ride. That's what it looks like to me. <laughs> Lots of good news today. You can see just a little bit of Rosie there on the there left side of the screen. I, I do see her. Yeah. Yeah. Looks like uh, she had a great ride. Well, and, and Richard, returning to kind of your journey so far, you were on hand for the last flight of the space shuttle and now the first yes. flight yes. of this new vehicle. That's that's some interesting bookends. It, it is. And, um, it, you know, being a part of STS-135, shutting down the shuttle program with that mission, it was very special. It was very emotional. Um, Chris Ferguson was a part of that, that mission, so I'm paired with him again coming up on this com upcoming CFT mission. But to start up a new program like this from the ground up, all of the, uh, the years of hard work that many, many people put into this, uh, it's very special. I'll, I will always remember that. Yeah, I'm sure. What would you say that this team needs to do and get ready for between now and the next mission? You know, what we need to do is we need to look at the data. Right, we're going to grab all the data that we we collected during this flight, break it down, 
uh, look where things can be improved, look where things don't need to be improved, because there's a lot of areas that that fall into, into both of those categories. And uh, really look at it with the eye in terms of what really has to happen uh, in terms of changing before we go fly CFT. That's what we need to go do. Well, Richard, thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate it. I think actually we are now um, going to go back to the field and uh, hear from uh, Sonny Williams, who is, who's going to be on this uh, capsule next time. That's great news. And I think uh, they may not quite have heard us, so I'm going to try again. Uh, Sunny and Rebecca, uh, can you hear us? Hey, hey, we can hear you now. Yeah, I am here with Sunny Williams. Uh, she is going to be the first post-certification uh, mission commander of the ship that's behind us here. Uh, Sunny, I've been in a lot of flight test readiness reviews with you. I've seen you interacting with our employees. Mm -hmm. I saw you at the landing and recovery uh, pre-brief meeting. Every time you're like, you have got to bring the ship back home so I can get into space with Josh uh, and fly it again. So give us a recap of how you're feeling watching, you know, Starliner return from space out here. Yeah, it was really pretty unbelievable. It was picture perfect. Everything about it was just amazing from seeing the tail as it flew in. Well, first of all, seeing the space station fly over, that was cool. Seeing the tail of the spacecraft fly, uh, fly over, see all of the pieces and parts start to come off, the forward, forward heat shield, the base heat shield, to the parachutes open up. I mean, it was just picture perfect. We had a beautiful, amazing team all out here ready to support. Everybody was pumped, everybody was cheering. It was, it was spectacular. I mean, it, she's back. She's home. Yeah. Uh, so, Sunny, uh, dating back to Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo, uh, all of the commanders of their space capsules have had uh, the ability to name their spaceships. And so, on behalf of the Boeing company, we would really love for you to name that spaceship behind us. Any thoughts on a name? Yeah, I have an idea. You know, um, uh, a little homage to other explore explorers and uh, the ships that they uh, rode on. I think we're going to call her Calypso. Calypso. So let's let's think about this, right? Uh, ship, uh, Jacques Cousteau. Jacques Cousteau yeah. yeah, his Absolutely. ship, Calypso. And so you're an avid diver, right? Yeah. So walk me through uh, why you think that name is fitting. Yeah, I, of course, I love the ocean. I love what the ocean means to this planet. We would not be this planet without the ocean. There's so much to discover in the ocean, and there's so much to discover in space. It just seemed like a natural marriage. We love it. Thank you so much for being here, and we can't wait to get you on that vehicle flying uh, to the International Space Station. And back to uh, Brandy and Stephen Houston. Thanks, everyone. The good ship Calypso. We have a name now for the Starliner spacecraft that has returned today to the uh, sands of New Mexico. Calypso named by astronaut Sunny Williams, who, along with uh, her crewmate Josh Cassida and a, and a few more yet to be named, uh, will be flying on this very vehicle the next time it goes to space. So a lot of activity out at the spacecraft today. Yeah, it'll be a little while before these crews are able to come back in. Uh, one more reminder, though, uh, we do have that 9 a.m. Central Time post-landing news conference coming up. Uh, that's a little over half an hour away. You'll get a chance to hear from uh, NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstine, uh, Jim Chilton, who's the Senior Vice President of Space and Launch for Boeing, and our Commercial Crew Deputy Director Steve Stitch. Again, 9 a.m. Central Time here on NASA TV.
And and we are seeing astronaut Sonny Williams look into the cabin of Starliner. That is her ship next. That is the good ship Calypso, named by NASA astronaut Sonny Williams, who will command it on its first operational mission to the International Space Station. Of course, before she does that, there'll be the crewed flight test. That'll be with NASA's Chris Ferguson, and Boeing's Chris Ferguson, apologies, and NASA's Mike Fink and Nicole Mann. All there on hand, taking a look at the vehicle and all uh, very eager to see the next Starliner in space. And of course, the uh, first thing anybody asks about is how's Rosie? We are pleased to report that Rosie is strapped in just like she was when she launched in very good shape. And as we look at these live images from White Sands, New Mexico, where Starliner has touched down about an hour and 34 minutes ago, this mission started back in Florida on Friday, lifting off at 5.36 a.m. Central Time, going up and uh, ran into the, the difficulty at orbit insertion, but managed to uh, get into a safe, stable orbit, accomplished numerous mission objectives and then position the spacecraft for a return home. That's right, and it turned, returned home uh, right on time at uh, 6.58 a.m. Central Time today. That was 5.58 a.m. Mountain Time there in the New Mexico desert. It's a video there from uh, the uh, landing as the spacecraft was floating under its three main parachutes. That was uh, two days, one hour, and 21 minutes into Starliner's first mission. And it floated down to a perfect landing, as you've been seeing, leaving the spacecraft in great shape. We're just about done with our coverage today, but we did want to give you one more reminder about the upcoming news conference. That should be coming up at the top of the hour, 9 a.m. Central Time, with NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstine. 
Senior VP of Space and Launch for Boeing, Jim Chilton, and uh, NASA's Commercial Crew Deputy Director, Steve Stitch. Again, that will be taking place at 9 a.m. Central Time uh, here from uh, the Johnson Space Center in Houston. Media who would like to t participate can call Johnson Space Center's newsroom at 281-483-5111. So at the conclusion of this first flight test of Starliner, thank you for joining us this morning. I'm Steve Seisloff from Boeing Communications. I'm Brady Dean from NASA Public Affairs. We'll see you next time.